And, you know, my plan today, I don't know, maybe I should shortly introduce myself. Also, my name is Aya Santa Chita, and I am uh, originally from Austria. And I started, you know, with monastic life 1992 in England in the forest tradition of Achan Cha. And before that, actually, I was all in Thailand as well at Achan Buddha Das's monastery. And then I came here to San Francisco and California in 2009. And since 2014, we are out here on the Sierra foothills with our small Bikuni monastery where there's five Bikunis and one Anagarika and two lay people living on an ongoing basis. And we have also guests. And now, you know, we have, we are already opening up for visitors again, as you know, more and more people are vaccinated and there's more kind of clarity how to handle all of this. So more about that you could learn on our website. You could also sign up for our newsletter. And today I would like to speak about the, what's called the four protective meditations. This is um, a theme we were just teaching about two weeks ago uh, at an online retreat for Spirit Rock and Anapodi Adamadipa and myself. And I thought, you know, that this is quite an interesting theme and that's why I wanna share it today as well with you. And I don't think any one of you has been on the retreat, so it's good. And the title of the retreat was uh, The Four Protective Meditations, Developing Courage to Meet the Way Things Are. And I just want to tell a real funny thing because they had a, a, a slide, you know, for a screen slide for this retreat prepared and there was a mistake. And so it showed and it said the four protective meditations developing courage to meet and then the way things are wasn't there, but there was to meet Ayananda Bodhi, Aya Santa Chita and Aya Dhammatipa. I made a screenshot. It's really true. And they said, hey, please change it. And, and then they, they just deleted it, yeah. <laughs> so that was really fun. Okay, so this is, this is a list of four meditations, which can not, the list itself cannot be found in the suttas, but all of the individual meditations are there, but they have been put into a list uh, probably around the fifth century AD in Sri Lanka. And, you know, they are called protective meditations because they offer protection from certain unwholesome mind patterns while, you know, developing wholesome qualities, the op opposing wholesome qualities, which are essential, you know, for the path, like a spe specific remedy, you know, which we take for a, for a certain illness. Those meditations are also tailored in that way that they work to transform a particular set of mind states. And, you know, they guard the mind from negativity and also they can also be used as a preventative. And so I'm just gonna mention them shortly. The, the traditional order is the first one is recollection of the Buddha. Second one is metta meditation, which you all know probably. The third one is meditation on body parts, asupa, meditation on the not beautiful. And the fourth one is recollection of death. So there's four different recollections. And the first two are showing us the potential of our minds. And the other two, the following two, the limitations of a human life. And together, you know, they show us the reality of our existence and, uh, you know, help us to see the way things truly are. And uh, the first to elevate the mind and the other to help the mind to let go of attachment. So I'm just gonna shortly go through them. And, uh, you know, we at the retreat, we actually didn't use the traditional order of the meditations. We started actually with uh, body parts and then we did elements also and then a recollection of death and then metta and at the end we did the recollection of the Buddha because we thought it's more suitable for people who haven't grown up in a 
Buddhist country. And, uh, but for now, I'm just going to go into each of them to explain a little bit the underlying principles. And, and then at the end, I want to give you a taste of it, but then doing a guided meditation, starting with um, recollection of death and then going to recollection of the Buddha. Well, you know, if, if any of you don't want to do the recollection of death and would rather like to do something else, then I think we could if you let me know now. Is there anyone who would not, who is against doing recollection of death? Sylvia, you don't want to do it? I can't hear you. I really don't know if I'm going to like it. So maybe I, uh, I go for a little while and if I can stand it, I, I stay. Is, is yeah. it okay? Yes, yeah. Because, you know, it's not like, it's not, it's not very uh, disconcerting, I think. And also, you know, if, 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 if a feeling of aversion comes up, for example, you can be aware of that, you know. The meditation is there for us to see the resistance, you know. So, but if you feel like you don't want to, to do it, then you just go out and come back later. And I think, you know, it's com combined with the recollection of the Buddha, because the rec recollection of the Buddha is very uplifting. And the recollection of death gives us a sense of urgency. So they are actually, you know, it's like a sandwich. And in the middle is our life, because it's, it's real, you know, that we will die. And on the other hand, it's real that the potential of our mind is the same as the potential of the Buddha. So together, you know, they are very, um, a very good combination of, of uh, things to consider. Yeah. But if you feel, you know, if you feel you don't feel shaky about it, you just um, go out and come back. Okay. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yes. So, so the recollection of the Buddha is you know, is, is a way of uplifting the mind and, um, you know, uplifting it and creating faith and confidence, you know, that because we know the Buddha was a human being, just like us, and he shows us, you know, what is possible, because he has completely, um, you know, developed the utmost potential of what the human mind can, can develop. And uh, it generates confidence in our own potential. And, uh, you know, knowing that the Buddha wasn't just a divinity, the Buddha was a human being. And I think that's very important to remember it. And he has realized the highest, you know. So in this, you know, day and age where there's a lot of... Uh, you know, not too much respect for, for myth any longer and a lot of, you know, deconstructing of concepts and then kind of, you know, we are missing that kind of um, inspiration, which, you know, in traditional Buddhist countries, people are usually much more uh, conditioned in that way. You know, they, they can gain aspiration or inspiration from doing these kinds of meditation for us Westerners. That's not so easy, but I think we should try, you know, because it's our inheritance from the Buddha and we can, we can use it to our best abilities. You know, to just remember, you know, the influence for good on this planet, which the Buddha has had, you know, over 2,650 years ago, and we are still benefiting from his his teaching and there has been an unbroken line of teachers passing on the teaching over the centuries. That's quite awesome actually, because if, if that would not be a valuable teaching, it would have just been forgotten. So I think, and then, you know, just imagining what it would be like to have a mind like the Buddha, that's just like, something we would never think of doing. And I think it can really help 
to open the mind and, uh, you know, to understand that the Buddha had a mind, you know, as vast as the sky. Whereas, you know, our minds, we often get very much stuck in the clouds which are moving through the sky and, and to just try to re imagine how that would be, you know, to have a mind as vast as the sky where clouds are just moving through and there is no attachment to any of it. And, you know, and in order to do this kind of meditation, there is a, is a list of qualities which we uh, can go through. And then for the meditation itself, you know, we are using just three out of those nine qualities. Then I come back to that a bit later. First, I just want to explain all the different meditation. Then the second one is a meta meditation as an antidote, you know, to anger, ill will and fear, opens the mind as well, you know, and keeps the mind to stay on track and embrace the way things are. And I don't think I have to speak much more about it because you know that kind of meditation already. Then the next one, the Asuba meditation. Suba means beautiful and Asuba means not beautiful. And that's, you know, looking at the body, seeing that the body is consisting of many, many parts. Traditionally, it's 32. But in this meditation, we just would use three. And it's about, you know, seeing the other side of the coin, because usually we stay very much, uh, you know, on the surface and seeing our own bodies and bodies of other beings as either attractive or not attractive. And we start just get really, you know, stuck on the surface. And this kind of meditation helps us to see what the body is really consisting of, of, for example, you know, bones, flesh and skin. And it's not, you know, in order to feel disgust for the body, but it's more to, to see both sides. You know, body can be very beautiful, but also it consists of those parts, you know, which are not really beautiful if you look at them. And that can help us, you know, to cool down the mind and to develop a, a measure of detachment, you know, from the body, which can be very helpful, you know, especially for monastics, of course, but also for anyone, you know, if we're really obsessed with our own bodies or with the bodies of others, this kind of meditation can help us to come into balance. So that's the function of is to come into balance to see the full picture. And then also there is connected with that is the meditation on the five elements, earth element, water, fire, wind and space, the five elements you know, the body consists of. And, you know, when we meditate in that way, it's, it brings home to us that, you know, that external elements and the internal elements are exactly the same the earth element out there you know the mountains and the rocks and the earth element in here the bones and the teeth they are exactly the same it's the same earth element so this kind of meditation can help us to get a handle on what's called like emptiness or anatta in the theravada language you know understanding that the body and the elements do not belong to a self. They are not a self. There's a constant process happening. And, you know, seeing the body as a mount, as a mount animal for consciousness, which we use, you know, for some time. And then when it's time to give it back, we give it back. And if we get used to that thought, you know, that the body is only borrowed from the element, if you really experience that in the meditation, that can really help us to let go. And also it makes us more sensitized to the environment as well, because we start to understand that the environment and the body, there's no difference. And I think if we would understand that deeper, our relationship to the planet would be much more careful but unfortunately, you know, we are, we are kind of quite confused about this. And then the last one is the recollection of, of death. 
which is uh, called Maranasati. And that is supposed to give us a sense of urgency, you know, to understand and to remember the vastness from which we are coming from and to which we return again. When we are born, you know, when we are kind of in the womb of our mothers, we, we grow and then we come out and then we leave and get old and then we die and we go back from where we came and we don't really know, you know, where is it? It's not a place, but it's a process. And this kind of meditation can help us to connect with that mystery and at the same time, give us a sense of urgency. It's a preparation. And at the same time also, you know, it's a healing process because we start to understand the whole, you know, that death isn't the opposite of life. Death is just what comes along with birth. When we are born, our death comes along immediately. So when we really allow that to sink in, it makes us more whole human beings and it, it gives us joy. It's kind of counterintuitive that that would give us a sense of joy because it really does, because there is this way of understanding that we are part of something much bigger than ourselves. And that gives joy. We don't have to figure it all out because we cannot. And when, if we really allow that to, you know, to sink in, it, ha it's, it gives us a sense of safety, which is very, very odd, you know, if you're thinking about it with the intellect, but if you try it out, you'll see for yourself. So, and it, it's, um, you know, it gives us, uh, it's, co it's considered an antidote to heedlessness. Because we do understand through this meditation, you know, that in the end, anything we can take with us is, is the disposition of our minds, is the disposition of our character, and everything else has to be left behind. And once we really, you know, make friends with that truth, it helps us to get our priorities right. So, so that was like a, a bit of an overview. And, uh, and then I would also know, like to mention, you know, protection, it's called protective meditation, not because it's a magic talisman, you know, which will protect you so that you no longer have any problems in your life. It's not like that, but it's more like the Dhamma as a protection from our own greed, hatred, and delusion, and from the greed, hatred, and delusion of others. And that's the true protection, you know, that in the midst of the samsaric chaos, we need, we have a sense of direction, and that's the protection. Knowing, you know, how to meet all of this, that's the protection. We still have to meet it, but, you know, we can meet it as a opportunity rather than as an obstacle. Yeah, and you know, an opportunity for transformation as a challenge, you know, because this, these meditations, they remind us of what is true, what is real and what is possible, you know, in terms of the highest and in terms of what's the limitations, old age, sickness and death, you know, it's limitations we need to, work with, we need to make friends with. So I think that's, you know, a very healthy way of spending a Sunday afternoon. And, uh, you know, to just, even you find a little bit, oh, that's, you know, I haven't been signing up for that for today at 1.30, recollection of death, but just trust me for a moment, you know, and, and, and give it a try. And if you really feel it's not good for you, then you just turn off the sound really, and you can stay with us. And it's the, you know, it's just the first part, maybe like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then we switch to the other part. 
And these two kinds of meditations I introduced to you today, you could either, you know, they can either be used as an individual meditation object or we can combine them or we can also use them just for a few minutes at the beginning of any kind of meditation, you know, to help if the mind is a bit sluggish, a recollection of death can give a little sense of energy. And if the mind is down, you know, and has no energy and is a bit depressed or something, the recollection of the Buddha can help to uplift the mind. And, you know, in some total, they help us, those meditations help us and protect us from getting lost in our hopes and fears and bring us back to what's truly possible. And uh, for some reason, you know, no, we forgot to do the precept. So I think we need to now, maybe before I go into the guided meditation, look a bit at the precepts and yeah, so Noam has a, um, yeah, great. This is an opportunity, you know, who, whoever would like to take the, the three refuges and the five precepts, you could do that now together with me. And if, you, if you're not interested, then just, uh, you know, observe. And Noam, maybe you can unmute yourself so I can have one person doing the responses. Okay. Okay, I can hear you. So I'm gonna start with with the Namotasa three times, and and then we do the refugees as a call and response. Okay. Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Utang Sarananga Chami Utang Sarananga Chami Tamang Sarananga Chami Tamang Saranam Gachami Sankang Saranam Gachami Sangam Saranam Gachami Tutiampi Putang Saranam Gachami Tutiampi Budam Saranam Gachami Tutiampi Tamang Saranam Gachami Tutiampi Daman Saranam Gachami Tutiampi Sangam Saranam Gachami Tutiampi Sangam Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Putang Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Budam Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Tamang Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Daman Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Sankang Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Sangam Saranam Gachami So I just say the precept in English and then you can repeat after me. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs, which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs, which lead to carelessness. 
Imani pancha sikha patani, silena sukatinyanti, silena poka sampata, silena niputinyanti tasma silang visotaye. Thank you. So those, you know, the five precepts, they are considered like the basis for Buddhist practice. You know, if you really want the practice goes anywhere, we need to base it on the precepts. It protects the mind from remorse, you know, and from lots of confusion or mainly. So it's a, it's a protection from going in the wrong direction, really. And then sometimes, you know, we make mistakes, but then we can just uh, start again. That's fine. So I think before I go any further, maybe I just want to ask, you know, is there anyone who would like to ask something to what I said? Any anything would need to be clarified before we go further? No. Okay, so we can just find a posture, you know, we can sustain for about 40 minutes. And I just would like to start with uh, poems from the book, The First Free Women. That's a contemporary uh, rendition of poems by Mary Weingast. And they're based on the Terry Gattar, which is a, a, a collection of poems from the early Buddhist nuns. And this is a contemporary adaptations. And this poem is called Sela the Rock. Long after the front gate swung closed behind me, I could still hear them. Why talk so much about death? Find a husband to share your bed, bring children into the world to leave behind after you are gone. But ever since I invited my own death, into bed with me. I no longer feel lonely or afraid of the dark. Who do we really bring into the world? Who do we leave behind? A gate swings closed, then opens. Where does it come from? Where does it all go? And this, you know, this meditation, the recollection of death is a little bit like inviting death to come closer, you know, as a, as a reality check, really. And this, you know, um, 
This meditation practice, I've learned it from uh, Venor Bhikkhu Bodhi. And it has three main themes. And each of the main themes is, is, is uh, subdivided into three sub-themes. And, and the main themes are, first one is, you know, considering death is inevitable. The second one is, the arrival of death is uncertain. And the third one is, when we die, we have to relinquish everything. And it's considered, you know, the cutting edge of impermanence practice to you know, allow those thoughts to come into the mind. Thoughts we usually don't allow to come into the mind. And there's like a, often like an unconscious way of, uh, you know, suppressing that by thinking, oh, not now or not me. Other people, yes, but not me. Somehow that seems to be an inbuilt defense mechanism, which we all have. But at the same time, we also know it is inevitable. And this meditation helps us, you know, to bring that truth a little bit closer, you know, one step at a time when we can and when we feel up to it. And then through that, we bring in some balance. So death is inevitable. How do we know this? Every other being who lived before me has died. Powerful kings of the past, presidents, the wealthy, the famous, the glorious, the holy ones, all have died. I can't be an exception. Just allowing that to sink in. And if you feel, you know, that there are some resistance in the heart, then you're just noticing that and making some space. Just allow it to be there. There's nothing which needs to be changed. Just being conscious. Death comes along at the moment of birth. We always think death lies in the future, but actually at the moment I'm born, my death has co-arisen. Always being there in the background. When causes and conditions come together, I have to die. Every moment I'm moving closer 
to death. At morning, when the sun rises, it moves ever closer to sunset. So from birth, youth, prime of life, old age, ever closer to death, every month, every day, every hour, every minute, every second, every year, I draw closer to my death. And then the next consideration is arrival of death is uncertain. The time of death is unpredictable. The people die as children, adolescents, in the prime of their life, middle age, old age. We don't know when. And the place of my death is unpredictable. It can be in our bed, in our home, hospital, while driving, while hiking, while swimming. There are so many different situations where death could come. And the cause of death is also unpredictable. Could be just, you know, dying from old age or from an illness, dying slowly or dying very suddenly, or an accident, stroke. It's unpredictable. When we die, we have to relinquish everything. All material possessions and status. Position, name, fame, all external acquisitions have to be left behind. And all who are near and dear have to be left behind too. Separated from our parents, children, 
spouse, friends, relatives, pets. In my body and my personality, my whole identity based on the body and on the personality must be given up too. And then as a last consideration is, we can only take our karmic volitional formation, the disposition of our character, which we have created. That's what we can take along. Everything else has to be left behind. Instead, you know, that recognition is considered, you know, to give us a sense of urgency for the practice. And then... Uh, Now, after we have you know considered those nine aspects we condense them down to the to three and go through them one more time first one death is inevitable and second one arrival of death is uncertain And third one, when we die, we have to relinquish everything. And that, you know, then we can condense it to one very, in, one intuitive sentence. Simply, you know, death is inevitable. So, you know, with the in-breath, just allowing that to touch us and then relaxing with the out-breath. And if it brings up like a sense of restlessness, then putting the emphasis on the out-breath. And if it brings out a sense of, you know, checking out or going to sleep, then the emphasis should be on the in-breath to really allow, allow us to be touched. Then, you know, with the in-breath, this could be my last breath. And with the out-breath, letting go and relaxing. With the in-breath, this could be my last breath. And with the out-breath, relaxing.
So this, you know, this meditation shows us the limitations of our situation. Being born, we also need to die when the time has come. And then, you know, we can now transition over to the other recollection, the recollection of the Buddha which shows us the highest potential of a human life. And this is the Buddha, you know, not as a historical person, but, you know, he's just a mirror to show us our own potential for full awakening, the Buddha within. And this kind of meditation is done, you know, in order to strengthen that faith, that confidence in our own capacity to fully awaken. And, you know, taking refuge into the Buddha within. recognizing in ourselves the very Buddha in whom we take refuge, the essence of all the practices, the, the knowing, awareness. We want to, you know, wake up to that potential to fully live in that awareness as much as possible. And Buddha Nusati can help us to, uh, you know, use it as a springboard for the heart and for the mind. By reflecting on those qualities, there are also like nine qualities. Before it was three times three uh, contemplations, and this is nine qualities, which I shortly touch on, and then we condense them into three and use them also you know, to go over them again and again a few times. And then you'll see, you know, the effect that has on the heart. It's, it's quite similar also to metta meditation. It opens the heart and uplifts it. And those nine qualities, you know, there are five of them are internal qualities of the Buddha, which make him a reliable teacher. And the remaining four are qualities of how the Buddha has been interacting with others. So the five internal qualities, the first one, maybe I should actually, there's a chant in the, in the Pali tradition, which is a recollection of the qualities, and I'm just going to do it once. This is, you know, um, like basically a chant, which is mentioning each of the qualities. And then afterwards, I go through them. And some of you might have heard the chant. It's, it's quite well known. Itipiso bhagavarahang samma samputo vichacharana sampano sukkato loka vitu anut Taro Purisa Dhamma Sarati Sata Deva Manusanang Bhutto Bhagavati. So Itipiso means so he is. And then the first quality, Arahang, which means uh, he has, is, you know that probably also from the word Arahant, you know, as the fully enlightened being in the Pali scriptures. And that means completely eliminated all greed, ill will, and delusion from the mind to never arise again. So that means fully purified and liberated from the birth, you know, the, the cycle of birth and death. And the second one is Sama Sambuto, which means perfectly enlightened, fully awakened, fully understanding all of the Dhammas and able to teach them. That's the wisdom principle. 
Then the third one, Vicha Charana Sampano, means perfect knowledge and conduct or a perfect uh, understanding and virtue and mastery of meditation. Then the fourth one is Sugato, which means well gone, means he has been fully gone along the Noble Eightfold Path and reached the goal. Then the next one is uh, Loka Vidu, which means knower of the world, fully understood all the worlds outside and inside, all the realms, externally and internally, also like the five aggregates, the six sense spaces, has completely understood all of that. And then the four qualities of interacting with others. Anuttaro Purisa Purisa Dhamma Sarati, which means unsurpassed teacher or trainer of people who wish to be trained. So he understands, you know, the capacity, disposition, attitudes of everyone, and therefore can really teach them really well, can guide them really well, knows exactly what somebody needs in order to be motivated and then you know, to move forward. The next one, Sata Deva Manusanang, teacher of beings in heavenly realms and human beings. Teach, you know, beings in all realms. Buto means awakened one, or also it can mean awakener, the one who awakens others. And the word Buto is actually used very rarely in the scriptures. In the scriptures, the Buddha is most often, you know, um, called Bhagawa or Bhagawan, which means blessed one. That's the last of the nine qualities. And still today, you know, in India, like enlightened beings are called Bhagawan or Bhagava. And it means blessed one or exalted one. And, you know, because out of his great compassion, he has fulfilled all of the other qualities. You know, over, over countless lifetime developed that uh, the paramita. So that's the three qualities then, which we will condense it down to the three arahang is purity, complete purity, samma samputo, complete wisdom, and bhagava, complete compassion. And now we can just, you know, go in the meditation through these three, and, you know, just imagining the Buddha, you being in the presence of the Buddha, either, you know, uh, an image, or you look at a Buddha statue, or just the atmosphere of his presence. Complete purity, arahang. And just try to bring that up by just looking at his face and, and his presence, the complete purity of his presence. And then complete wisdom, Sama Sambuto. And you look into his eyes and you see the confidence in his gaze. He knows he has fully realized. And then the last one, Bhagawa, complete compassion. You see it in his smile. He has a light smile on his lips. And then again, Arahang, complete purity. And looking at his complexion, at his face. Samma Samputo, complete wisdom. You know, looking at the confidence in his eyes. Bhagava, complete compassion, you know, seeing the smile, light smile on his lips. Arahang, complete purity. Samma, Samma, 
put all complete wisdom. Bhagawa, complete compassion. Arahang, complete purity. Sama Samputo, complete wisdom. Bhagawa, complete compassion. Arahang, complete purity. Sama Samputo, complete wisdom. Bhagawa, complete compassion. And just noticing, you know, what that does to the mind, to the heart. Opens the heart. And shows us, you know, the direction, shows us a sense of possibility for our own heart, for our own minds. Just you know, being aware of the spaciousness of the mind and the heart. If the mind wanders off into thinking, just you know, coming back, or well, goes through the three qualities again, the complete purity complete wisdom and complete compassion. Now we can sit a few more minutes and then I'm going to ring the bell at the end.
I want to share one more poem of this book, which relates to this Buddha Nusati. It's called Suchata, born at the right time. The day began just like any other. We dressed, ate breakfast and went to the park. As we were passing the Anansha woods, I remember someone saying, let's go to see the monastery. We pushed open the door and there he was. How did I know? It was, his, it was the eyes. I sat down and the Buddha taught me the Dharma. You there, be ready. Does today feel just like any other day? So we're slowly coming to the end of the meditation. And uh, so that's, you know, showing us the limitations and the potential combined in one meditation. I think that's very good exercise for the mind to really stretch wide and embrace, you know, everything.